Good early afternoon. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, back pain, and it's probably easy to recognize that most of us uh, will suffer back pain throughout our lives. Um, the data shows about 80% of adults will have back pain at least once in their lifetime. And an aside to that is of those 80%, 80% of them will also have back pain um, intermittently, which means in more than one occasion. Um, in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, back pain uh, surpassed the common cold as the most common reason people would go um, to seek care um, of a provider for uh, their, their complaints. Um, and you can see in, in 2009, the CDC said approximately 30% of all adults in that year had it suffered some sort of back pain. Um, probably the most common causes when we look at the data um, is repetitive trauma. Those repetitive traumas can start in our early uh, years, uh, whether in our uh, preteen or teen or early young adult years. Um, bending injuries or lifting injuries tend to be one of those that uh, tend to impact uh, most people who suffer back pain. The lifting injuries typically, um, as the drawing or the figure to your uh, reading right, um, shows a, a person bending at their hips um, without flexing their knees, which puts an undue stress on the, uh, the spine and carrying uh, weight. It's interesting to note that the weight that a person lifts probably has little to do with the strain and stress that's applied to the back. I mean, it can impact it, but we, I've had many patients who've bent over simply to wipe something off their shoe or to pick up a piece of paper. So it's, it's interesting to note that it's not necessarily the weight as much as it is the activity or the inherent uh, inability to do it well. Um, there, is some, there is some data that shows that a lack of exercise, uh, which will result in weight gain in most people, um, that lack of exercise inherently impacts people's uh, fitness of their muscles of their spine as well as the fitness of the muscles throughout their body. Um, I interestingly published a study um, in 94 um, going back to the bending improperly that showed that bending um, required more than 100% of normal flexion. In other words, when we measured people who were without pain, just looking at their normal ranges of motion, uh, that uh, when you bent forward to its maximum without allowing the hips to participate, that when a person would bend over, and in this case in the study was to pick up, a, I believe it was a piece of paper or a newspaper from the ground, that, that bending and picking up a newspaper required more movement of the spine than just regular normal range of motion. And so sometimes the task of bending and moving things uh, requires more of our spine than just what we would normally expect. Um, it's probably important uh, when we consider back pain, uh, whether it's a clinician or just an individual, to understand a little bit about the anatomy. The reason the anatomy begins to be important is um, the structures of the back tend to um, have a degrading or difficult time coping with the changes in stress. Uh, if you look at the top right-hand side of the uh, drawing, there is a structure uh, called the intervertebral disc, and you'll see it sits between most vertebrae of our spine. Um, when you pull it out, like the top right-hand drawing shows, uh, it looks like a small jelly donut. The outside of the disc is made out of a tissue called fibrocartilage. And the inside, or well, the outside is called the annulus fibrosus, or just the annulus. The inside is called the nucleus pulposus. It's a jelly, uh, gelatinous type of material that helps maintain water content in the disc, which ends up being important in allowing the disc to maintain some of its ability to uh, move or deal with uh, vertical uh, stresses. The importance of the annulus is, is that fibrocartilage is, is, is the tissue in the body when injured will never heal. And that's why I, uh, when I initially talked about those repetitive types of injuries, um, things can begin when we're very young, whether it's you know the bicycle wreck or the tree fall or uh, sports injuries. And as we get a little bit older, things begin to be more violent type of injuries, whether in sports or car accidents or slips and falls. 
But once that injury has occurred, that tissue, unfortunately, will degrade over time. And that's what we'll commonly hear in descriptions from MRI reports and x-rays about degenerative disc disease, bone spurs, uh, disc bulges, sometimes disc herniations. They're all the consequence of this process of wear and tear. And there's really not too much anybody's going to do about it. It's just a progress of time. Um, it, the hard part is, is people progress at different rates, whether they're 13 and 14 and may have arthritis or, you know, the older people um, who don't have any arthritis that's evident on an x-ray, but if you were to go look um, with advanced imaging, you would probably find some of the changes that are suggested. Um, as a consequence, um, most of the time when we do x-rays on patients, uh, the things that we see are is related to that degenerative arthritis, making x-rays, most cases of back pain, probably not useless, but provide little clinical information. And so they probably, one of the things that shouldn't be done on most patients with just mechanical type back pain. Uh, there's a, just another picture of the annulus and the nucleus and that a description I was giving you earlier. You can see how it looked like a small jelly donut. Um, if you look down in the bottom right-hand corner of that disc, you'll see there's a tearing of the outer rings of the annulus. Um, that allows for a inability to resist that outward uh, force or outward uh, displacement of the, of the nuclear material, and that's where those disc bulges tend to go is where they're uh, like water to an area or a path of least resistance. And you can have that nuclear material migrate all the way out into the spinal canal. Um, and we go from the disc bulge or the disc herniation to what we call an extruded fragment. Um, those can be rather painful, um, but in most cases can be managed very easily with just some time and some very good anti-inflammatories. Intermittently, those things will require some surgical procedures to remove the the jelly outside of the spinal canal. It just depends on the symptoms and the patient's progress. Um, on this slide, uh, there's the examples of what we talked about, um, the narrowing of the disc space, the bone spurs, uh, the bulging discs, and that wear and tear process. Um, the x-ray to the far right, um, at the very bottom, you can see a narrowing of that space. It's not evident to most of you because we don't spend a lot of time looking at x-rays in our normal life, but if we look at the space just above it, that's the, the widening of that space is, is what one would consider more normal, whereas the one below it, that space is significantly smaller than the one above. And they should be pretty symmetrical in size, and we start to see some of that decrease in space that suggests some of the wear and tear or degenerative uh, changes. And then on the third vertebrae above, you can see a very small bone spur off the top of the front of that vertebrae. The bone spur is reactive bone. It's really a, it's suggesting of some changes in the way the body is dealing with the stress is secondary to this arthritis. It's another one of those signs. This slide shows bone spurs off the front of most of those vertebrae and narrowing of those disc spaces. Um, the back three arrows are pointing out joints called facet joints. Um, each of the vertebrae and the discs make up what we call a three joint complex the disc and the two vertebrae in the front, and then there's two joints in the back called facet joints. They're a lot like most normal joints, what we'd call a uh, hyaline cartilage type of joint uh, that will deal with stresses differently than the way the vertebrae and the disc in the front do. As they go through or progress through the degenerative changes, you will see um, that uh, mottled looking type of appearance that will suggest that there is some uh, bony uh, changes that are occurring. Um, it's also secondary to degenerative changes. In the second disc space in this uh, x-ray, um, there, there is a uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis noted on this x-ray, which is significant because it shows a progression of the, the wear and tear arthritis from something that one would consider mild or moderate arthritis to something much more severe. Um, and in those cases, sometimes um, the treatment can become much more aggressive than just some of the conservative treatments we'll talk about. Um, treatments of the back. I mean, typically medicines, one would look at over-the-counter uh, types of uh, medicines, ibuprofen, 
um, Tylenol, things that are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that have um, provide some benefit for some of the population of back pain versus prescription medicines. Uh, some of the um, prescription medicines that seem to be uh, effective, again, deal with more uh, inflammatory or anti-inflammatory um, responses. Um, I'm, um, and when it comes to therapy, I'm more of a person who recommends exercise and activity versus the passive physical therapy, the hot packs and the cold packs, electrical uh, modalities, ultrasound, those types of things. Um, I think that the benefits from those are short-term, um, provide some patients with some relief, but would get the same relief with long-term benefit by exercise. Um, I will much, much rather my patients being active. Um, there's been some recent studies that have come out looking at particular types of exercises, um, two, and, two that I can think of offhand that are dealing with yoga and finding patients um, who deal with fibromyalgia respond very well to yoga. Um, fibromyalgia being a musculoskeletal type of disorder, uh, much like back pain, um, exercise is probably going to be um, a significant benefit to most patients who deal with back pain. Uh, having said that, back pain uh, is intermittent, it comes and goes. Exercise sometimes can cause an exacerbation of back pain. But the exercise has other benefits that I think are important uh, that we consider uh, when looking at discontinuing exercise for the benefit of decreasing someone's back pain. When we consider that, um, we're really asking the question, uh, is a person's back pain uh, significant enough to stop exercise? Because then we're suggesting to them the risks of things like obesity and heart disease. Uh, increased rates of strokes and cancers and things along that line are worth uh, the discontinuation of exercise to decrease their back pain. I quite frequently will encourage my patients to maybe decrease or moderate their exercise for a period of time to cope with their back pain, to use some of the passive therapy, I mean not passive, some of the conservative therapies, but continuing their exercise um, because of its uh, global effects on the human uh, human condition. Um, the last one, massage. I think there are some studies that show benefit from massage. I think it's short term. Uh, and if we can find therapists who are effectively able to manage some of the myofascial things that uh, result uh, with uh, stresses and long-term discontinuation of activity and exercises, uh, those types of massage probably provide better benefit. Um, as a chiropractor, I use uh, manipulation. Um, or an adjustment depending on the uh, description of it, uh, basically taking a, a joint um, and taking it to its extremes of joint play and pushing through it causing the joint to pop is how most people will describe it. Um, there is a fluid in most joints that will uh, pop or cavitate is the fancy word for it under stresses. That popping sound is uh, generated as that fluid will pop or cavitate and it's actually very audible um, due to the fact that bone is a very, very good conductor of sound. Um, I've already talked about a, uh, activities, but active physical therapy, uh, it to me is a significant improvement um, in managing people with back pain, particularly looking at the big gym ball exercises that deal with in, uh, helping a patient who has back pain with um, some balance control issues. Um, there's some studies that show about 80% of the adult population who has back pain will have some balance control issues and getting them working on the ball um, will help um, decrease the frequency of uh, back pain. Uh, we get further down on the list, we're looking at epidural uh, steroid injections where we're treating a patient who's non-responsive to most other therapies, um, injecting the uh, space where the nerve will come out with a high dose of an anti-inflammatory uh, to see if we can control the pain um, in that manner. Um, and then, of course, another option is surgery. Uh, surgery is not um, a, a typically a first option, depending on uh, signs and symptoms. Sometimes it is, um, and sometimes is a, a discussion that's necessary to have. Um, I quite often think that uh, patients' fear of surgery is something that um, limits their ability to improve without that discussion. I think sometimes the discussion allows them to see where they are in the, in the extent of care and the options that are available for them. 
Um, I think surgical consults sometimes provide a patient with enough information to be able to make an informed choice on all the therapies we've talked about, including surgery, instead of making a decision based upon um, other people's good or bad outcomes that may have resulted. Um, so sometimes I will talk to my patients about visiting with surgeons. Um, preventing injury, um, I think the easiest ones is just to work on maintaining uh, good weight, uh, di trying to disperse the forces that the spine has to cope with over um, less of a distance, um, practicing good posture, particularly when it comes to those of us who spend uh, time sitting behind computers, uh, that the monitor is elevated high enough that we're not having holding our head in a forward position looking at the bottom of the monitor asking the muscles of the neck to hold the head up um, when they should be allowing the head to sit on top of the shoulders probably more comfortably um, driving is another location where we seem to see people uh, sit with their heads forward um, not back on top of their shoulders um, regular exercise, which I talked about earlier, uh, deals with a lot of systems that impact the way our back pain uh, could be created or be controlled. Um, those are probably the three best ways of preventing. I would add the fourth one, and that is, is being aware of our lifting, uh, making sure we're lifting with our legs um, and our arms and not just with our back to uh, decrease that lever. Um, these are some of the things we talked about earlier um, that um, back pain, uh, past primary care and, and seeing patients for just the common cold. Neck pain has also moved up in uh, its frequency um, and its uh, morbid more morbidity and people seeing the need to seek for care outside of um, just a, a time and, and over the counters. They will see their doctors more frequently. Neck pain has moved up. I think it has a lot to do with the uh, the uh, bad posture and the strain that we apply um, to that area. Um, there is some studies that have been shown that uh, manual therapies, whether manipulation, uh, dry needling with acupuncture needles, um, stretch, massage have been more effective than just um, over, I'm sorry, just prescription medicines and uh, uh, physical therapy, that it requires something a little bit more um, when I treat, I effectively uh, use a neck adjustment um, with care. Um, I, I will use it as needed. Um, I don't believe that uh, patients who are pain-free um, need uh, long-term care from, with manipulation. I think it, it has been shown in the literature that it's much more effective when we're treating patients for pain. Um, in fact, no studies have shown that if we uh, treat patients with manipulation while not having pain, uh, it doesn't appear that it has any impact. Um, and no study has been shown that it does. Again, we go back to rehabilitative exercises, looking at range of motion, looking at motor control activities like we talked about with, uh, with the spine, with a uh, balance system. Um, massage can be effective. Again, I think it deals a lot with finding massage therapists who's effectively managing these myofascial trigger points and has the ability to help change the, um, the muscle activity and get the muscle to relax. Uh, mobilization is mentioned. That deals a lot with stretching, taking the joint through a certain range of motion. Um, that typically requires an assistance. It's not something we do just on our own. Um, Again, uh, things we talked about with back pain are just as important as when we deal with neck pain or joint pain in, in uh, general, and that is trauma, uh, poor lifting, repetitively sitting in bad posture, um, and, and sometimes the things we put into our body, um, that can be a form of stress, um, will impact uh, quite often not just joints, but particularly the neck, since it seems to carry most of the emotional or physical stresses that we deal with. And then, as I said, mental stress, uh, whether it's the loss of a family member, uh, change in job status, which seem to be the, high, the two highest um, stressors uh, um, that the body deals with. It's quite frequent for patients to come in complaining of neck pain and headaches. Um, we go back to and we deal with um, patients with neck pain that working on their normal range of motion, bending the head forward and backwards as far as possible, uh, going side to side, turning side to side, making sure that we're 
uh, obeying the principle of use it or lose it. If you don't put your body through the demands that uh, it was designed for, you're going to lose it and that ability to do it will disappear. Um, increasing your activity level does have an impact on uh, neck pain as well. Um, I'm going to move through because uh, I think some people will have some questions about uh, acupuncture. I started practicing ac acupuncture a couple years ago. Uh, quite frequently, um, I will see patients who will present to the clinic with neck and back pain um, for acupuncture treatments. Um, I have not had a lot of success in treating people with back pain. In fact, I've had far more success in using um, and treating people with neck pain and headaches than I have with uh, have had with back pain. And quite frequently, I will encourage patients to use other modalities uh, for back pain before using acupuncture. The Research, unfortunately, in acupuncture is lacking, and so it's very hard to um, to reproduce their studies and find the effectiveness that the studies suggest that they're having. Uh, acupuncture is a very old therapy. It's about 5,000 years old. It started, uh, we believe, in actually in the area of India um, and migrated um, over into China where, in a sense, the therapy was developed. Um, there is the premise of the 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 flow of chi along uh, 14 meridians throughout the body, chi suggested to be this uh, uni universal life force and that its impact uh, or the impact on chi can influence disease processes. I have found it to be very effective in treating peripheral joints, mostly uh, feet, knees, elbows, hands, and again dealing with patients with headache. Uh, the most effective studies have been shown that um, using what's uh, the point called pericardium 6 on the middle of the forearm has been very effective in treating nausea and vomiting associated to chemotherapy. Um, there's an example of meridians in the, um, on the um, drawing on the right. Uh, you can see that there's the meridians listed. Uh, there are two that are not listed that run along the center of the body, the governor vessel and the, um, the conception vessel, um, and that would make up your 14 meridians. Um, those points I typically will use um, to needle to close to the associated places that people uh, have uh, complaints of. Uh, there's an example of auricular therapy where um, the human body is flipped upside down and in the bottom or over the lobe of the ear is a person's head and then the spine would run along the inside of the ear and then you can see that there was the shoulder or the scapula and the arm and the hand and then the legs and the feet um, more towards the, op the top of the ear. The, eye, the upside down drawing of the human is called a homunculus and we see those um, in certain places in the, um, in the body, um, particularly when we look in the brain at the post in the precentral gyrus, uh, which map out the areas where we feel pain and, and movement occur. Um, and some people will use these auricular points to treat patients with diseases in those areas. And sometimes I'll use them if I think they can assist the patient. Um, in Taoist Chinese philosophy, the women are on the right side of the body and the men are on the left. And so you'll needle those areas of the body. Um, you'll needle those areas of the body um, depending on the, um, the gender of the patient you're dealing with. Uh, there's examples of the needles. They are really super fine. They um, measure probably a, uh, anywhere from uh, a half a centimeter up to about two centimeters. Um, these needles that are on the slide um, are what are called Watu needles or Chinese needles that have metal at the end that allow you to hook up an electrical current or a TENS unit um, to, uh, I use them typically to treat patients with muscle type pain um, to get the therapy directly into the muscle where the soreness is. Um, appreciate all of your time and effort um, um, here. If you have any questions, please feel free. Okay. Uh, first question is, can you have low back pain cause your neck and your shoulders to hurt? The answer is probably um, when we look or consider 
stresses, and as we talked about earlier, how stresses impact um, particularly the neck. Um, it is quite common for um, places where, and that's not just the back, it could be an elbow or wrist, uh, but dealing with changes in our lifestyle or activities, they tend to be very, uh, will cause neck and other neck problems. Um, I have not heard of the, uh, the back joy. If, I, if you would be happy to give me some time, I can look it up and I might be able to send you an answer on that. Um, I don't think flip-flops actually um, have an impact on back pain unless they are worn all the time. I think there needs to be some support of um, the arch because of its impact on controlling activity. Um, there's lots of things that can cause back pain uh, associated to walking. It really depends on the location of the pain. I've had some folks who... Uh, that quite frequently when I see them, their back pain is more pelvic pain or associated to a joint called the sacroiliac joint, which is part of the pelvis. And so walking, since the only time it bears or moves anything, is when a person's on their feet. So I would think, um, you know, it depends on the cause. That would be something we could consider. I had another question about a... Um, a young man who was injured, uh, fractured a couple of vertebrae, um, and asking questions, what I can do, what could be done to keep it from gener degenerating. And the actual answer is there's probably not a lot you can do to prevent the degeneration. We can't predict its change over time. Um, unfortunately, um, I think one of the things we can do is find an activity or exercise that may be helpful in treating um, him. I would search for exercises. I would look for recumbent bikes. I would look into swimming pools, things where we can put a little less stress onto the spine in treating it or doing our activities. Um, I think glucosamine and chondroitin are effective in treating peripheral joints. I don't think they're, however, very effective in treating um, the fibrocartilaginous joints associated to the knee and the spine. Um, Another question, uh, diagnosed with fibromyalgia and osteoarthritis in their knees. Um, I have noticed that my lower back has been hurting more and I'm leaning forward when standing. Uh, what suggestions would I make? Um, one, I would be uh, focused on the, the postural things. I would try and uh, find a way of doing what our, our mothers used to do when we would slouch when we were younger and, you know, they would pop us on the back of the head and tell us to stand up straight. You might want to find a way of having some type of feedback that reminds you that you need to put your um, back and shoulders over top of your pelvis. Um, I'll typically encourage patients to use uh, colored dots um, at their computer monitor, in their car, uh, places where they tend to have slouching or bad posture. Um, you might want to do something where you're putting a, a colored dot on the on your shoe or some type of reminder that you can see to act as a feedback that will help you to um, maintain better posture. It will make an impact. Uh, the question is, is, will it do it effectively enough to manage? Um, there's another question. Um, back, neck, shoulders, and ankle to gain any restoration and freedom of pain. Um, I think physical therapy, as I've said before, if it's a physical or an active, it will be better than passive therapies. I, have, I quite frequently refer patients who rather do therapy than manual therapies uh, to do that. Um, a question about which is the best over-counter medicine for back and neck pain, I typically recommend the ibuprofen. Uh, making sure the patient is doing that, having food on their stomach, um, using it uh, for uh, no more than 10 to 14 days, and then giving their stomach a chance to recover from it. Um, you can use it uh, 400 milligrams three times a day to help you deal with the inflammatory processes. Um, then there was a question about having a degenerative disc and being uh, slowing the progression. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any data that shows that we can slow the progression of disease. Um, I've seen our degenerative arthritis in 13, 14-year-old kids, and I've actually had a patient recently who was 72 who had zero degenerative arthritis evident on an x-ray. Again, I do think there was probably some. It's just not significant enough at this point. Um, I do treat patients who have fibromyalgia pain. I, would, I typically want them exercising. 
Um, looking at the data on patients with fibromyalgia, the exercise is one of those things that's absolutely necessary uh, to get the maximum benefit from any treatment, whether it's medications, therapy. Uh, typically, when I consider fibromyalgia patients, I'll talk about dry needling, uh, using acupuncture needles that um, to work or manifest uh, benefits in, in the muscle groups. Um, I don't ever recommend anything related to pillows and um, mattresses because there's actually no good studies or any studies at all that have uh, looked at changes that may have occurred in patients over time. Uh, there is a question, is it okay to pop your neck? The answer is probably not. Um, it happens infrequently, but pa people do injure themselves popping their neck. Uh, it's, it becomes very habitual, and you'll see a lot of it, um, particularly in the young adults. Um, but it doesn't appear that it uh, provides any benefit um, for a person to pop their own neck. That's not suggesting that coming to see me when they're having neck pain and using those joints to change muscle activity is not beneficial. But it doesn't appear if we did our own neck that it does anything. Um, there is a question about walking and having leg pains. Um, it says that my legs hurt from my shins up to my back. Uh, what could be going on? Um, it, it could be a couple of things. Uh, we could be dealing with just degenerative arthritis, and as a consequence, seeing some uh, symptoms, if it's in both legs, that are associated to stenosis. If it's in one leg, uh, we could be looking at something, putting uh, pressure on a nerve, um, a peripheral nerve, um, outside of the spine or just, at, just inside of it. Um, Again, dealing with the degenerative changes. Um, there's a question I have on inversion. Um, I have no issues with inversion. There's really no good studies that show that inversion is beneficial. And so it's one of those things where I typically will tell my patients if they want to try it to find one that's been used where the person who's selling it probably didn't have any benefit, um, that they would be worth trying. Um, Long term, for those that it works for, it decreases pain and soreness. Um, it allows the uh, the disc spaces. It, we we think it allows the disc spaces to open up for a little bit, taking some of the strain off the the ability to hold water inside of it. Um, another question um, that they had advanced degenerative narrowing, and asked the question: Is there any treatment to help? pain besides anti-inflammatories. Again, it goes back to, I think, finding one of those treatments that we talked about that may be beneficial, whether it's manipulation, adjustment, massage, dry needling, acupuncture, and particularly exercise and activity. Um, it, sometimes the finding the right treatment requires actually going through the process of finding it. Um, pregnancy, um, I, I adjust women who are pregnant uh, quite often. Uh, it's safe. There's no there's no um, injury to the uh, to the to the child. I, however, will not do acupuncture on pregnant women. Uh, there's been zero studies looking at um, the efficacy and the safety of uh, needles in in women, so I avoid that. Um, um, there's a question is what causes pain in the inner part of the shoulder blade and how can you leave it? It really depends. There's a lot of structures in that area. Uh, muscle, there's uh, ribs, there are rib joints, there's the spine, uh, there's uh, a number of muscles of the shoulder blade, there's muscles from the neck, uh, there's referred pain from the shoulder and the scapula. In other words, there's a lot of options of uh, things that can cause it and, and I would have to know which of those it is. Uh, but most often, again, it's going to be depend if it's from the shoulder, if it's from the neck, what area we'd want to focus on. Um, after back surgery uh, for a bulging disc, can that cause hip pain? Um, it can. I don't think that the surgery caused the hip pain as much as it is, is uh, maybe a decrease in activity and some pre-existing pre degenerative changes in that shoulder. Um, Options to use uh, if you're allergic to ibuprofen is, is Tylenol. Um, acetaminophen would be the, uh, the generic name for it. Um, I do think that aqua therapy is a good uh, treatment for back pain. Um, it does a number of things. Uh, the one thing that I, that I struggle with aqua therapy is because of change in the, in the body's 
association with gravity, uh, that those muscles that we talked about earlier don't get that um, gravity change. And so it does some um, ability to do some aerobic fitness type of stuff uh, that's important, but we're missing the, I think, the one essential, and that is having a patient uh, challenging their balance system. Um, what is the, I have another question, what is the best exercise for a middle-aged woman to lose weight and strengthen the abdominal muscles to help support the lower back? Um, whether it's a young adult, a middle-aged, or an older person, male or female, uh, the, according to the American College of Sports Medicine, the number one exercise that we should do is something that gets our heart rate to go up and maintained at a certain level for 30, uh, a minimum of 30 minutes. Uh, we should be doing that about five days a week. Uh, it's something that everybody should be doing every day. And that is not a, a sport, in other words, playing basketball or volleyball or football. Those types of things um, don't do the heart rate up consistently. They, it goes up and down uh, sort of like a pogo stick, and that's not going to be of benefit to uh, maintaining cardiovascular fitness at the level that we need it or even help us lose weight. Um, La uh, two more questions that I have. Um, uh, feeling popping along the spine, that's probably some of the wear and tear arthritis and some of the joints moving. Uh, it could be muscles sliding along bone or ligament or things like that. Um, there's a patient who, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, um, an attendee asking a question about uh, having spinal stenosis and how they can get it treatment. They're more than welcome to call the Kelsey Clinic um, and they'll be able to make a referral. Um, to the one of the three locations that I'm at. Um, oh, unless they have Kelsey Care and they don't need a referral, they'd be happy to call on their own. Um, there was one question that I'm not sure I know the answer to, but it's about replaying the webinar, and I'm going to let someone else answer that. Hi, this is Valerie from Marketing. Uh, yes, we will be uh, posting this on our website. You can go to kelsey-siebold.com slash webinars and this should be the recording should be up uh, hopefully by tomorrow well I'm done I appreciate all of your time I know that most of you want